Welcome back. This is the first uh, summary video for the first lecture topic on prehistoric art. So the images that you see here are the list, rather, of items in red. Those are the ones you want to be able to recognize and be able to uh, write about or discuss for the purposes of the test. Most of the time I try to make sure that the um, items that you're responsible for knowing are in red on the screen that'll match up with your um, review sheet as well as the review PowerPoints. You'll also find sometimes the uh, vocabulary terms popping out in red. So it just kind of alerts you if there's something that you need to know when you're looking at the PowerPoints um, on your own. So I usually start each lecture with a list to kind of give you an idea of what we're covering and some of the things to look out for. So we're going to be looking at some stone carving and cave painting. Some examples you want to know, the Venus of Willendorf, the woman holding a stone uh, bison horn, the spotted horses uh, from the Peshmaral cave, and the hall of the bulls from Lascaux. Those are sort of your main things. We'll also be looking at the image of the deer hunt from Cathal Hook and at Stonehenge as our examples for prehistoric art. So to kind of set the stage here a little bit, the image you see at the bottom there are skulls of sort of ancestors of Homo sapiens. These are <clears throat> hominid creatures um, that eventually evolved into human beings. And so we've existed roughly two and a half million years in this kind of form, two and a half million years ago from the point that we're at now. And that's really the <clears throat> image that you're seeing here on the screen is of a timeline. So we're at this end of the timeline, and what you're seeing really here in this dark black area is the era leading up to the time that we're going to study. So the existence of hominid creatures leading up to Homo sapiens, this is the span of time during which it took us to develop to the area that we're reaching right here. Where that dark blue section starts is about 50,000 years prior to today. And roughly 50,000 years ago, we start seeing things that we could consider modern human behaviors, the uh, use of language, the creation of tools, etc. But notice how long this dark blue section is before we reach this light blue area. That light blue section at the very beginning of it is the foundation of ancient Greece. And where it turns from light blue to red is where we hit the Renaissance. So this long blue span, this is everything we're covering in this first lecture. We're then going to head into ancient Greece, and our class ends right here at this barrier between the light blue and the light red. Survey 2 is just this tiny section from the Renaissance to the 21st century. So it gives you a sense of scale of time. If this dividing line between light blue and red is roughly around the year 1600, it kind of gives you a sense of the huge span of time, how long it took us to develop from these creatures into something resembling what we are today. So a lot of the development that happens in the Paleolithic, Paleolithic means old stone age. Paleo is old, litho is stone. Um, we see some kind of rudimentary beginnings of what we might consider art making. And it's kind of interesting to consider how the human body also sort of develops over time. There is a theory among um, biologists and archaeologists that the advent of our ability to walk upright and the idea of the um, skull not being completely hard as a baby right after birth, it takes another three or so months for the skull to grow to its full size and to solidify in its form. So you could argue that this is something that's very different about human beings from apes, that essentially the first three months after birth equates to what we could consider a fourth trimester, three more months of development that happens outside of the womb in which the head begins to grow to accommodate the brain that is required for the activities that we engage in as human beings. So we could argue in some respects that this period of um, development immediately after birth is what really separates us from other um, hominid creatures and really allows us to develop the kinds of aspects that we consider um, 
central to our humanity. One of those things, of course, is the making of tools. So here are some of your first vocab terms, stone blades and stone burns. The blades or chisels are what you see up at the top in the um, kind of recreation. These are created by um, basically chipping um, one stone against another to create a long, sharp shard. And then those stone blades and chisels can be used for doing the larger aspects of carving to create artworks or to create objects, fetish objects to carry with you. The stone burin is a much sharper stone that's used for incising uh, lines into the carving. So the majority of the work of removing large sections of stone is done with tools that we loosely classify as our stone blades. The burns, on the other hand, would be the ones that incise the details and the linear aspects. You also have on the screen the terms Paleolithic for Old Stone Age, roughly 30,000 years ago to about 9,000 years ago, and the New Stone Age or Neolithic when we start seeing settled communities and the building of permanent structures, uh, specifically the megaliths. Think Stonehenge, that's the Neolithic era. This slide gives you an example of the use of stone to create the stone burns. And so you can kind of see a very thin, small, sharp piece of stone attached to a reed or to a bone being used for a scratching, scraping method that would allow you to incise lines. We know that very, very early, this is roughly 200,000 years ago, there were attempts to create effigies or images that seem reminiscent of human skulls. So the very earliest examples that we have of art that starts to look like human beings are these crudely carved uh, skull imitations. So we associate a lot of the imagery of the earliest um, art that human beings make with death and with birth, with these two kind of extremely important um, moments in anybody's life, but certainly to uh, the development of a culture. We can also see stones that have already sort of a basic form that suggests an animal or a human body being just slightly changed or augmented to increase that appearance. So we know that people were using their imaginations. They were looking at naturally formed objects and beginning to see ways of manipulating them to make them even more fully resemble um, representational images from the real world. This is a very early example known as the 1010 figure. It's about roughly 300,000 years before today. It is also relatively small. It's only about six centimeters in length. So we believe this to be one of, if not the earliest, one of the earliest attempts to create a sculptural depiction of a human form in stone. Moving into the Upper Paleolithic era, roughly 90,000, 100,000 years ago, so we've just jumped pretty uh, far in time, closer to our own era, we start to see more of these types of figures. They are generally referred to as Venus figures. Now, of course, the goddess Venus, the idea of a goddess of love with that name, will not occur until the culture of ancient Greece. So we are using this name, applying it after the fact. The people who made these had never heard of Venus. That was not part of their religious or worldview whatsoever. Why do we call them these? Well, by the time that these were discovered, of course, our culture had uh, developed and, and evolved from ancient Greek and Roman culture. We used this concept of the goddess of love as a symbol um, in a lot of different um, art forms. And so the idea really was to kind of take these ancient examples and sort of associate our contemporary views onto them. So the idea that she is obviously exaggerated in the hips, in the pubic area, in the breasts, really emphasize not only the childbearing and childbirth aspects, but the rearing of the child, the breastfeeding and so forth. So clearly these are objects that are small. They're not large sculptures. This one's only about a couple centimeters in width. What you're looking at in 
most people's point of view is an object that is small enough to be portable, to be carried. So we believe that our ancient ancestors were primarily nomadic. They weren't able to leave permanent large scale sculptures in um, their domiciles because they were moving all the time. It's also believed by a lot of people that these Venus figures collectively served as tokens as omens, as fetishes, perhaps as things that would bring good fortune to a pregnant woman. You can certainly see that the ancient people were fascinated with and really revered this kind of life-giving power that they saw in the feminine form. So there are lots of these carved figures that very clearly emphasize the aspects of feminine um, anatomy that would uh, kind of show or showcase or emphasize the role of a woman in the process of bringing life forth. So you can see that most of them don't have faces. They have very often limited sort of um, suggestions of facial features. The arms and legs are usually held very close to the body, and that's a practical issue as well. If they were extended out from the torso, they'd be easier to break. So it does kind of help keep the object more permanent, but it does also bring us a little more abstraction, a little more emphasis of attention on the aspects of the anatomy that really emphasize this concept of the role of the woman in childbirth. We also know that our ancient ancestors were more um, technologically savvy than we have given them credit for being. This is not a stellar example of a piece of art. What you're seeing, though, is actually an imprint of a woven mat that was imprinted into some clay just in the act of being used, being sat upon. Um, and that formed a fossil over time. So this has been carbon dated to basically provide us with proof that people understood the technology involved in creating woven fabrics, woven fibers, as far in the past as 26,000 years ago. So certainly the kind of sophistication that is necessary to develop a culture is really beginning to happen for us roughly 30,000 years ago in our past. So there are lots of sites all throughout Europe where we have located carved stone objects such as these. You can see that they begin to have an increasing amount of attention to the details of the human face and to representation. You can see that evolving over time as well. One of the more interesting pieces um, that we could look at is from about roughly 23,000 to 21,000 years ago. This is in the Hermitage Museum collection now in what is Russia today. And you can see that she has clothing. She's got some form of woven fabric that's being used uh, to create what looks perhaps like a brassiere or a bikini. You can also see that the hair is stylized in such a way that it may actually represent not hair, but some form of a cap. That's definitely the case with the first piece you want to recognize for the test. This is the Venus of Willendorf. She is by far the most famous of these so-called Venus figures. She's named after the village where she was discovered, Willendorf in Austria. She was discovered in 1908. So imagine... Uh, thousands of years of the evolution of our culture without knowing that these objects exist and then discovering them in the 20th century would really be kind of a, um, a almost a shock changing what we know about our uh, history as a as a species on the planet when you look at the venus of willendorf you can see that she's really fairly small she's only about 11 centimeters in height she is carved more fully in the round than some of the other examples that we've seen um, you can see if you look at the breasts which are of course very exaggerated you can see pretty clearly here fingers you can see the arm resting across the breast as well. So her arms are not extended out from the torso, but they're kind of resting on the body, but they're very much diminished in order to emphasize hips, breasts, belly to kind of suggest pregnancy. But if you look at the way that mo most people refer to as the hair has been detailed, it's in very rigid kind of concentric circular uh, rows. If you see it from above, it really begins to take on the appearance of a knitted or woven cap. So this is an artist's recreation of what they suspect 
expect the kind of clothing might actually have looked like. So it's not so much that the um, depiction is of hair. I really kind of believe that the um, representation that you're seeing here does bear um, or does correlate rather with the examples that we have of uh, fossilized examples of weaving. So you can see that our technology and our skill in craft is beginning to increase pretty dramatically. This is roughly, again, 25,000 years in the past. This is a, another uh, series of uh, photographs compiled together. So you can see front, three-quarter, and a reverse angle view. You can really see that the attention to the anatomy, although exaggerated, is really um, sophisticated in some respects. And you can imagine carrying this object as if it was some form of charm or some uh, religious object maybe that could help you intercede with higher powers to bring about good health, to bring about successful uh, birth experience. It's kind of a remarkable object in many ways. There are bunches of carved figures in different materials from roughly 30,000 years ago. This one is uh, found in France. It was made of ivory. And you can see here that the face has been more or less attempted, but at the same time is really in a fairly abstract state. It's very simplified and more of a suggestion of a face. We also find some animal-human hybrids, and we don't really know for sure if these were used as religious objects or not, but it's kind of interesting to speculate what human beings' relationship with nature would be in this really prehistoric era. So this piece is carved out of mammoth ivory, so it itself is from an animal product. Um, it is definitely an object from the natural world in that sense. We want to emphasize a couple vocab terms here. The Venus figure that we looked at, Venus Willendorf, is a sculpture in the round, meaning that you can see her, as I showed you earlier, from the front, from the side, from the top, from below. She's fully three-dimensional. As opposed to the type of sculpture you see to the right, that's known as a relief sculpture. So a relief sculpture is one that projects forward from an otherwise essentially flat background. So you can have um, images projecting slightly or images projecting much further from the background, but the idea here is that they're attached essentially to a flat background. Um, the face of a president on a coin would be a good example of a relief sculpture that you carry around with you. This piece we definitely want to know for the test as well. This is also uh, discovered in France from the Paleolithic era. This one is known as woman holding a bison horn. You can definitely see that the figure has been treated very similarly to the way the figure of the uh, Venus Willendorf is. The arms and legs are much uh, smaller proportionally than the rest of the body. You can see that there is a little bit more attempt to create believable anatomy in the hands in this piece, probably because it's attached to a background would allow the artist to be able to move the hand that's holding the horn away from the body. There's also some um, traces of reddish paint on many of these sculptures, and that again suggests a connection to blood and to childbearing. Kind of interesting. I always think it's fascinating to look at the art of the past and then look at how similar those images are to images that are still um, relatively contemporary. This is the work of um, abstract expressionist painter Willem de Kooning, who became really famous for images that were very abstract and loosely painted, but had um, subjects that were women with exaggerated breasts, hips, and they look a lot like the Venus figures. I think it's kind of interesting that artists who were in the mid-century, mid-20th century, trying to tap into spontaneity and into a kind of universal abstract language began to revive images that were really kind of similar to what our ancestors were doing before language. We also see some artists in the 20th century delving more directly into the subject of childbirth and child rearing. This is the work of an artist named Judy Chicago who created an entire series of images around the idea of birth. Traditionally, in the Western culture, we've moved away from this kind of more graphic depiction of um, the body's biological reproductive um, 
process and the process of birth. So this is sort of a, a feminist artist reclaiming that territory and doing that in a way that also kind of harkens back to the kind of style and imagery of what the ancestors were doing. You can see that also in the work of the performance artist Enamendithia. You can also see the use of small figures, small sculptural collected figures. That's something that we still do to this day. You may have people in your family who've collected small figurines. That's a very American kind of tradition to have small porcelain or plaster figurines. It goes as far back <clears throat> As the example that you're seeing here on the left is obviously an image that was meant to um, speak to the horrors of slavery. This is a slave auction. Uh, it was produced by John Rogers, who was an artist who created small scale sculptures to be collected in the home. And they would have been sold much like you're seeing here with the image peddler who would make his business selling small uh, reproductions of sculptures to people who wanted to show art in their homes it was not an unusual thing. So when we think about the ancestors making images about childbirth, images about um, exaggerated abstract female anatomy and making small scale sculpture that may sound very foreign but you can see that we're still doing some of those things today we're still even collecting things that are kind of similar to that there was even a movement in american sculpture in the 20th century to do something very similar to what we just saw in prehistoric times, finding uh, a stone or a rock that had a suggestion of a form and then just slightly altering it to create a little bit more direct image to bring out what the artist's imagination was seeing in the rock became a process of making semi-abstract sculpture in this country. So then thinking about the two-dimensional art forms, one of the best examples we can look at are examples of cave paintings. Um, these have been found all over the world. Um, we know that these particular caves, we're looking at a set of caves here um, in India, and these had uh, human inhabitants roughly 100,000 years ago, but the paintings date almost universally across the whole planet from roughly 30,000 years ago. It's sometimes called the creative explosion, this period when suddenly human beings all over the world begin making images both carved in stone and painted on walls that are relatively similar. Um, some of the ways in which they're similar are kind of fascinating. You see most of the images here, where again in India, tend to be of people and animals in silhouette. You tend to see kind of flattened forms. And more often than not, you can see arms and legs pretty clearly. You sometimes can see inside of figures. That's what you're seeing here is what we sometimes refer to as an X-ray uh, style in which you can see the interior of the body. So this could be a female deer pregnant with a baby inside. You can also see that it's pretty important to combine um, aspects of the body in a way that can be recognized. So here you can see that these figures, again, these are Indian cave paintings. Again, we have the torso, the shoulders facing forward, but the head seems to be in profile and the legs seem to be in profile. We'll see that pretty consistently throughout the ancient world. When we get to Egypt, you'll notice it very distinctly. You can see that pretty clearly here as well view image of an elephant there that's painted in dots and lines. Other examples from India include these elephants that also have repeated parallel crosshatch kind of style lines. It's kind of fascinating to think that these things that date from roughly 30,000 years ago in India are very similar to the same time period images that are found in places throughout Europe, in France in particular. These are some remarkable paintings in Bidbetka in India. These are paintings that are not technically in a cave. They're actually in an, um, on a wall an overhang of rock protected them. They managed to last until our modern era. And these are some of the images from that site. You can see they're really pretty sophisticated. Another overhang shelter that gives you an X-ray view of an animal. You can see the body is kind of bisected, split apart so that the legs here, here, 
here and here are saved almost to be able to show you the interior. This is another case in which there's an overhang of rock rather than a cave that protects these images. So you can see that very simplified geometric forms are being used. And almost all of the images you've seen so far have been either white, red, deep brown. You can see a lot of use of these dots and stripes as perhaps the simplest marks that people make. But we'll see those all throughout um, Europe and other sites around the world. We've now moved to France, but roughly the same time period, about 32,000 years ago, and you can see that most of the animals, just like in India, are in profile. Uh, we can see usually all four legs and the details of the head. We're seeing some more surface detail in these examples than we saw in some of the examples in India. Here you can see in the Chauvet caves that the animals are painted one on top of the other, and so since that is also referred to as x-ray style. We can refer to this um, as x-ray, but obviously knowing that there is, in no sense of the word, a technological aspect to it. They're not trying to predict the advent of x-ray technology. What's more likely is that images were painted one on top of the other by successive generations. They also can show you how it creates a feeling of movement. In this area in particular, it feels like there's a herd kind of rushing across the walls. Really kind of remarkable. It's fascinating to me that these images of mammoths and horses look so similar to the ones that we were seeing in India. These are people who would have no way whatsoever of communicating with one another and yet are making art using the same types of tools, symbols, and shapes. Uh, the material that is being used for the most part across the world is known as ochre, and ochre is essentially an earth pigment. Think of it as a rock dissolving, uh, mineral dissolving in the earth over time. So there are different types of ochres. The majority that we'll see tend to be kind of yellowish, red-ish. Um, those are the most dominant ones. We'll also see some use of black, which more often than not is charcoal, so burned wood. These are all images made with this type of material. So people are harvesting this. It's relatively easy to find soft deposits in the earth, but it has to be kind of mixed into a paste with something sticky like animal fat or even human saliva to get it to stick to a wall. So it's kind of fascinating to think that this is not something that's just found lying in the cave and then picked up and used on the wall. This is something that people would have had to go out, find, collect, process a bit, and then bring with them into these areas. So it implies that the art that's being made is done so very, very intentionally. I also really like this painting technique. This is kind of similar to graffiti in some ways. If you've ever seen um, spray paint uh, graffiti done with a stencil, this is very similar to that process. It's a reverse stencil. In a way, what you're doing is blocking a section out and then spraying your pigment around it or on top of it, removing that obstacle, and it leaves a negative empty space. In this case, human hands. This is usually done by blowing through a reed or through a hollow bone. So they would take the pigment into their mouths and then kind of spit and blow it through this tube, um, almost like an airbrush. And so if you had your hand against the wall and you blew red or black um, against it, and when you moved your hand away from the wall, you'd have the color of the stone of the wall with this kind of pigmentation surrounding it. Kind of remarkable. The shot gives you a good idea of how that blowpipe technology would work to make a human handprint. One of the things that I really find fascinating, though, about these handprints, and find them right here are some good examples above these horses. Right here, this is in the Peshmarl cave in France. What you're seeing there is examples of handprints above and below to the sides and that use again of those surrounding dots. These are all kind of similar symbols that we find all over the world, but the hands are particularly interesting because people have studied these and looked at anatomical differences between male and female hand anatomy and have discovered that 
what taught when I was a student was that the paintings were done by men, the cave paintings. We now know that there are examples of hand impressions on the walls that are female hands, that are adult male hands, and that are also examples by children. So my belief is that the paintings on the cave walls were done by groups of people together and that they obviously had a significance to the cultures that made them and that they brought their people back to these sites to add to those murals, to add to what was there over and over and over again. This diagram gives you a good example of seeing the difference between a male hand and a female hand. It's really kind of fascinating to think about the fact that we know because we have studied human anatomy for long enough, we can now recognize kind of a window into the past and see how art making was really um, something that was sacred, I think, to people of the entire human family. The idea of showing simple details and emphasizing life-giving details is part of the sculpture. It's also part of the painting. This is a horse from a cave in Lascaux in France. When I first saw it, I remember thinking that they really got the anatomy kind of wrong. But the more that you look at the way that the legs into the hooves are painted, it's really pretty accurate. The distortion seems to be this swell here and the tiny head for sure. So obviously there's a little bit of perhaps unintentional, naive, uh, proportional error. But I think what's really more um, important to consider is the swell of this belly is likely to show us that the horse itself is pregnant to kind of bring a, another aspect of that uh, reverence for reproductive ability for this um, generation of life. It's really kind of a theme throughout the art of the ancient world or the prehistoric world. This gives you a good idea of, there's the horse we were just looking at, how high up on the wall a lot of these are, overhead in places, with very abstract symbols around them in many cases. And it also gives you a sense of how difficult it would be to get into these caves to make these paintings. This is an overhead map of the caves of Lascaux, and it shows you that in places, the passages become really, really narrow. There's even places where you'd have to almost belly crawl to get from one chamber to another. And of course, they're lighted now with electric illumination, which the people who made them wouldn't have had. So the people who made these would have had to harvest the ochre, they would have had to prepare the materials, they would have had to carry the items with them in these arduous, difficult to access caves and to bring something along to illuminate so that they'd be able to see what they were doing. There are even in the walls in some of the caves where we have found uh, depressions in the wall that would have been used for the placement of primitive scaffolding so people could get higher up on the wall to um, paint things high up and on the ceiling. So the concept to me is that these are not just random scribblings. This is something that people had intention to make. And no one really makes anything or does anything that doesn't serve some kind of purpose. There are very few activities that we engage in that are this difficult if they don't serve us in some way. So whether they are a um, record of history, whether they're trying to teach the children something about the world that they live in and the way that their culture works, or whether there's a spiritual significance, it's clear that they're meant as a form of communication. And that's really at the heart of what making art is all about. It's kind of fascinating when you see the scale of them as, as well, when you see a person beside the paintings. Really gives you a different sensibility about how much effort it to make these and how, in a strange way, they feel almost as if they're naturally coming out of the walls themselves. Definitely want to know the Hall of the Bulls from the Caves of Lascaux in France. It's pretty easy to recognize, of course, because most of the um, creatures in this section are bulls. You can see the x-ray style in terms of animals being painted one on top of the other. I'd also like you to keep 
in mind that what you're seeing to a degree is what we call the composite view. The body of the bull is in profile, but of course the horns look more like what they would if you were looking straight ahead at the face. So we have a combined point of view on the body here. You can really see the composite view quite clearly in this case, right there. Human figures appear quite often more simple, uh, simplified than the animal figures, which is also kind of an interesting case. These caves are in Spain, but the similarity in the style is kind of astonishing. So when you think about the um, artwork that we're seeing here, whether it is from India, from what is now France, what is now Spain, you can see that people are beginning to think and express in very similar ways all around the world at roughly the same time. This is a figure known as the shaman figure discovered in a cave in France, and he connects very clearly to some of those anthropomorphized human-animal hybrids that we saw, probably a spiritual significance to this one as well. Uh, definitely, there are uh, animals being depicted in a lot of the works, whether they are carved or painted. Um, and we know that some of the animals that are depicted were food sources, but lots of them weren't. Um, a lot of research has gone into analyzing bones found in the caves, and it appears that a lot of the animals that were consumed for food purposes were not being depicted on the walls, which also, I think, draws us into this question of what is the purpose of the wall paintings and the carvings. I think increasingly, the more that I've studied it, the more it seems to be fulfilling a religious aspect, um, a spiritual connection between people and the world around them and wanting to make a more permanent connection by making it, these images in stone, in clay, and in paint. These are uh, clay bison from a cave in France. They're really remarkable pictures. It is also kind of intriguing to think about this need to paint on walls and ceilings. We refer to these paintings, even from the prehistoric era, as murals, just meaning painting on wall. But when we think of a mural, quite frankly, we tend to think more of this type of thing. But how interesting is it that this is a painting in a church. It's a painted image on wall and ceiling, very much like what we saw in the caves that we've studied so far. These are all religious paintings on ceilings that create this sense of movement and a sense of repetition. They have a connection to what we've seen in the prehistoric artwork as well. In America, we have a mural tradition that also is about um, how our society functions. These were very prevalent during the Great Depression and into the um, Second World War. The, during the Great Depression, the government set up um, what became known as the alphabet agencies. The WPA, or Works Progress Administration, found work for people, um, helped to build highways, electric dams, but also things like um, paintings in public places. We have one in Wilmington in our downtown uh, post office from that era, and the themes of these most frequently are of family and farm and factory. It's kind of sharing visual images about how our society is going to function, and you can see these here very clearly. Family, farm, factory, family, farm, factory. It is really showing how our world is interconnected, how our society needs to function together. And it's similar in a way to what we saw people doing in the prehistoric caves. You can see the graffiti style in the 1980s. The work of Keith Haring is simplified human forms. They're very abstract, really, but they communicate kind of on a universal level. They're easy to recognize and to understand. People have made performance art by making art out of the body that emphasizes the human anatomy and the difference between male and female bodies. You can see that here in performance works. Um, it's kind of fascinating to think that Ev Klein is making human beings into paintbrushes, but the images that are produced look a lot like the Venus figures that we saw. There are artists making non-objective abstract art out of nature itself, and the forms they tend to make 
in earthworks, such as the work of Annie Goldsworthy, very often are either simplified human forms or spirals, circles, cross-hatched lines, and dots. There are lots of examples of artists from the 20th century looking back to the art of the past for inspiration. This is the work of Elaine de Kooning, the wife of Willem de Kooning, who earlier, who literally made a series of paintings and prints based off of her experiences interpreting the images from the caves at Lascaux. It's kind of fascinating to think that she's painting these in the 1980s and they look very much like the work that we studied from the prehistoric era. In Australia, you often see the um, carved stone petroglyphs and painted images using similar shapes, dots, circles, and in this case, the marks of animal hoof prints as well. But these images definitely fit into the same kind of tradition that we saw in India, that we saw in Europe, now we're in Australia. This serpent rock gives you sort of a combined view as well. There's a profile and an overhead view, and we can see into the interior of the body in an X-ray style as well. These hunter figures could easily have been um, made in a similar way, almost the same style as what we saw in India as well. The large scale silhouettes, simplified human forms here of the kangaroos, very much like what we saw in France. This again is kind of an exploded view. It allows you to see some of the interior of the bodies, both of kangaroos and of people. These are stone carvings in China. And again, like no matter where we go in the world, you're seeing the same types of marks being made. Probably lines and dots are the easiest things for people to paint or to carve. But it is sort of fascinating to think that at roughly the same time all around the world, people are making similar images in similar ways. When we move even to Central America, you can see images that repeat this spiral form is seen in a lot of stone carving and painting all around the world. So whether people are making directly representational images or whether they're making non-objective images, in some respects, what we're seeing here is a need to leave your mark on the place that you inhabit or on a place that you feel is spiritually significant. There's some very interesting prehistoric art in Central America, including these miraculous spheres. These are obviously human engineered objects. We don't know exactly what they would have been for. Um, some of them can be as much as several tons in weight. They can grow to the size of almost six feet in diameter. It's kind of remarkable to think that carving of almost perfectly round spheres is an activity that humans would engage in. Why? It had to be significant to the people who did it. It obviously, I think, represents a way of human beings interacting with the world in a very permanent way, leaving a mark or a reference point for other people. I think it's part of what goes on in the mind of someone who wants to make these. But don't they feel like very contemporary, objective, abstract sculpture? It's interesting to think that the kind of art that's being made today by artists who tap into the subconscious is very similar to the art that our ancestors made. That brings us to this concept that I think is pretty significant for us, the idea of entoptic images. So entoptic images are images that you see when you're not actually getting real um, exterior stimulus to your eye. Most of the biological reason why you're able to see things has to do with rays of light hitting an object. Some of those wavelengths are absorbed by the object, others are reflected, they bounce back to your eye, and the rods and cones in your eye interpret those wavelengths in terms of value and color and you're able to see. But if you're not having light passing into your eye, you do sometimes still see images. That can happen when you are in a meditative state. It can happen when you are in a drug-induced state. It can also happen if your eyes are closed and you lightly press against your eyelids. You certainly have had the experience of staring at something bright and then seeing flashes or uh, refractions with your eyes closed after the fact. That's 
all in the category of entoptic images, things that are happening to your eye that your brain perceives as visual, even though they're not really there. And the entoptic images we generally see can be classed into these six basic forms, this kind of spider-webbed vein shapes, concentric curves, concentric zigzags, dots, parallel lines, cross-hatched lines. And when we start really looking at the way that prehistoric people made art, they used these symbols, these shapes, to form things. There's our spotted horse we were looking at earlier. It's really just a sophisticated combination of this basic idea. So it's kind of intriguing to think that on some level, even if you are not receiving um, a visual image because your eyes are open and you're looking at something in the real world, these dots, lines, and so forth are kind of ingrained in the DNA that makes human. Every human being is able to see these types of lines and shapes under certain non-visual circumstances, and it happens all around the world. The artists of 30,000 years ago are making art out of these types of lines and shapes. That brings us then to 20th century artists, like the artists who worked in the style known collectively as Der Blau Reiter or the Blue Rider. This was a group that was formed in Germany and they painted in very bright, intense colors and sort of abstract um, even in their earliest days. But they moved from this type of painting to this. And you suddenly see this non-objective abstraction that includes lines, parallels, spirals, nested curves, all of the kinds of lines and shapes we saw in prehistoric art. I don't necessarily think that the artists who made these were intentionally imitating the art of the cave artists. I honestly believe what they were trying to do was tap into their own subconscious and generate imagery from that source. It's just fascinating that the images they were able to create seem so similar to those that prehistoric human beings made. It's kind of a remarkable aspect of what it means to have a visual language. Even though this is very abstract in some ways, we've seen shapes and patterns made like this all the way back to examples that I showed you on cave walls in Australia, in India, and throughout Europe into Latin America. It's kind of amazing to think that as human beings, we all share this visual language together. The spiral certainly is a shape that will come up again and again for us throughout art history. You can see here contemporary earthwork sculpture of the mid 20th century that uses that spiral form to kind of mark a special space. As we move into the Neolithics, we move into settled human communities. We start to see the working of stone to make buildings and to make permanent structures. This is a very early um, example that I can show you, arguably the first permanent human settlement in Jericho. A head created from a human skull with plaster that is really literally rebuilding the shape of a human face on top of a base structure. It's kind of a remarkable thing that once we settle, once human beings begin to form societies that aren't nomadic, we begin to see real advancement in language, in uh, religious practices, and in the visual depictions that we're able to make as well. These examples come to us from Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, and you can see here what we believe the buildings would have looked like, what these um, sites would have uh, looked like as they were being um, constructed. You can see exactly on the large scale um, upright forms, carvings that depict animals and bird forms that become really quite sophisticated and almost fully three-dimensional as well. They're really pretty remarkable objects. The standing stones are actually possibly human beings. If you really look at it, you can see the arm and the fingers and perhaps a belt, a loincloth. They seem to be larger than life forms based on human beings. Maybe they represented gods to the people who inhabited this area. It's another overview of the type of permanent human uh, settlements that were possible roughly 36,000 years ago, or rather 3,600 years ago. <laughs> 
there are plenty of examples of exaggerated human forms that begin to feel a little bit more um, sophisticated in what is being represented. The correct numbers of fingers and toes, for instance, the way that the arm muscles and the flesh begin to move feel just a little bit more realistic in these depictions here as well. There are plenty of examples now as we get closer to our own time period into the Neolithic era of figures that share a sense of emotional expressiveness. We didn't feel as much of a connection to the earlier figures because they perhaps didn't have as much facial expression and now we're beginning to see a little more of that as well. In the settlement of Kafal Hayuk, we can definitely see um, real sophistication in the way that human beings begin to live together in groups. And the homes in Kafal Hayuk are really kind of remarkable. Um, most of the buildings are kind of built side to side. The access is through the roof, and then you'd walk across the roofs rather than through streets. So you would descend into your home down a ladder, and this is uh, one such site that has been slightly uh, renovated, so you can see that some of the wall decorations are um, bulls' heads, these horned animals that are used as uh, decoration. You can see here the ladder and the way that the ceilings would have been placed so that you can get a sense of moving in and out of these spaces. The paintings are also really interesting in Katal Hyuk. You not only have sculptural forms, but you also have painted forms. So we want to know the deer hunt from the Neolithic era in Katal Hyuk. The last example for this um, uh, purposes of the test for this first lecture is the Neolithic uh, megaliths at Stonehenge. Stonehenge, of course, is one of those sites that a lot has been written about, a lot has been speculated about. Um, a lot of people believe that it was the site of uh, druidic sacrifices. There are um, conflicting uh, reports about exactly what the purpose of the structure was, but we do know for a fact that it changed over time and that it is related to another site, um, really relatively um, similar in terms of its uh, structure, but at a removed distance. We know that the stones themselves were um, hewn and brought to this site from other locations. And in some cases, they had to move really from quite far away. So again, it shows an intention to create that is really kind of um, remarkable, considering that we don't know the exact history and purpose of every object there. We've been able to, to determine some of the most likely uses of the space. Some vocab terms you want to make sure you have here are megalith. Mega literally meaning large. Litho, again, is stone. So constructions of enormous stone. The way that the stones are put together is by and large, a post and lintel system. The post is the vertical, the lintel is the horizontal. Think of it kind of like a door frame. A hinge is a circular or semicircular area that's enclosed by usually a ditch and some form of a bank. So if you can imagine digging a circular trench and then building up a bit of a wall on one side of it, that would be your bank and your ditch and then stones inside of that. The uprights could be either stone or wood, and we'll see a wooden hinge that is connected um, to Stonehenge as well. The trilith would be a post and lintel construction of megaliths, two uprights and one horizontal. So this gives you an idea of the um, layout of the uh, site of Stonehenge. And you can see that there are several areas that have been around the outside. We know that there is a stone marker uh, here near what we call the heel stone that sort of directs you in terms of the direction of sunrise and sunset at the solstices. So the belief is that the entire site is aligned along that access. So it is most likely that it would be of most importance at sunset and sunrise during the two solstices every year. Around the exterior of the henge, there's a series of holes. These are known as the Aubrey holes. 
then you have series of stones in kind of a horseshoe shape. These are the trilithons here. And this inner hinge here. You can see the various uh, stages of construction. The first construction stage been just the construction of the ditch with the bank and then this circle of Aubrey holes. The Aubrey holes, some of them have been discovered to have human remains in them, but analysis of those remains has proved that some of the people who were interred here were not related to the um, ethnicity of the people who lived in this area. They would have been people who came from elsewhere or their bones would have been carried there from elsewhere. So we believe that this was a nomad site that people from really relatively far away were able to travel to this site for the purposes of religious veneration of their dead. We also can see here in the second stage the arrival of stones in this circular shape. You have this horseshoe shape of your triliths, trilithons, and a circle around the outside of what we call the sarsen stones. And then the rearrangement, this is sort of the final form of the uh, monument itself. The blue stones were rearranged roughly around the year 2200 BC. So we have still our horseshoe shape here of our trilithons. And then the rearrangement of the stones into two circular forms around the outside. We also know that the stones themselves were found elsewhere and moved to the site. So the smaller stones at Stonehenge are the blue stones. They all came from as far away as southwestern Wales. So this gives you an idea of what had to happen. The stones had to have been moved across at least a little bit of land to get to a river or across a slightly further distance and then carried by sea through the Bristol Channel and then carried across land and via river to get to the location of Stonehenge. Not uh, far from there necessarily, a little bit closer, only about 20 miles are the uh, location of the Marlborough Downs and that's where our sandstones came from. So the stones that make up this site came from quite far away, which again raises the question of why the thing would have been done. My argument is always that no one does anything this difficult if it doesn't have a hugely important significance, either a religious or a cultural significance. It's also kind of fascinating to think, although the stones look rough, they're really very sophisticated in the way they're put together. The stones that make up the lintels are actually notched, so they fit into one another this way, like a key, but they also have indentations in them this way that fit into kind of nubs that are carved upward from the standing stones of the post, so they all sort of lock together into this site. It's pretty fascinating to think that the way that this building or this structure is aligned would allow you to see the summer solstice sunrise in this kind of specific axis right through the center of the site itself. It's kind of a remarkable thing to think about. It's also interesting to, that there is another site. Here's Stonehenge. This is near the Durrington Walls, a site that's become known as Woodhenge. And Woodhenge is essentially a uh, circle of stones, a uh, circle of uh, wood um, beams upright that would align with the winter solstice. It's really kind of a remarkable thing to think about. So wood would be a material that's associated with growing things, with trees. Stone would be associated with things that are of the earth. So you could argue that the Woodhenge site is a timber site that's associated with life, and that Stonehenge is the related site that's associated with the idea of death. And so these two sites would operate as like spiritual beginning and end of life for people of the 
surrounding regions. They would be visited by people as holy relic sites. Really kind of a remarkable idea. All right, so that's all for our prehistoric examples. We'll move on to uh, some really intriguing cultures as we go forward. We're aiming for uh, a pretty thorough study of Egypt and Greece and Rome as well as we go through uh, into unit two.